everything said and shared as part of this meeting is part of the permanent public reporting that is shared to the, uh, shared to the Bureau website. Uh, so please keep all comments appropriate as necessary. Uh, Shelly, please go ahead and share all please. All right, Alyssa, Michael, Andrew Tang, Anthony Griffith, Need to hit star six to come off mute, Tony, or put it in the chat. Yeah, okay. Yep. Hand up. We got you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Brent Forget. Present. Brian Stevens. Hey, good morning. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Who? Charles Who? Dr. Jones? Clifford Jones? David Natrika. Debbie Johnson. Present. Edgar Bissonette. Bronzo is not gonna make it. Gail Bradley. Present. Present. Darth Gamer. Present. Herman Butler. Ivan Pizerton. Here. Nick L. Present. Nurse Patel. He Good said morning. he's trying to join. Good morning. Roz Reed. Present. Ryan Southworth. Present. Danny Nygaard. Present. Sean Boker. Tara Johnson. Present. And Vicki Bennett. Present. Thank you, Alyssa. All right, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your patience as we ensured we had forum there today. Uh, just for a chair report, uh, your attendance report is in the packet. A reminder, if you have two or more consecutive meetings, I will be able to reach out to you to ensure that you would like to remain on the committee. Uh, next, we'd like to uh, welcome a new member, Alyssa McCall. I saw you uh, put a comment in the chat, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to staff. Thank you. I figured out my mic, so I appreciate Ex excellent. it. Excellent. <laughs> welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we have one current vacancy, and that's the representatives of a statewide rehab facility. Uh, if you are interested in applying, please submit your letter of interest in CV to Shelly Bissell. Her email address is on the uh, agenda, and that will be forwarded to the ADHS director for review. Uh, in the meeting packet, we do have the draft uh, agenda for our, our draft schedule for 2024. Uh, we just ask that the members take as minutes to review that and make sure there isn't any significant conflict. Uh, we understand that there's a large number of conferences that are often held throughout the country. And so we do our best to avoid the big ones that are relevant for our stakeholders, uh, but want to make sure that we don't overlap any uh, significant religious holidays, et cetera. So if anyone sees a conflict on that, uh, please let us know and we can try to adjust the schedule as necessary. All right, hearing none, uh, we will go ahead and move to uh, the Bureau Report, which are Chief Garcia. All right. Well, good morning, Dr. Bradley and Stab. Uh, we have some slides this morning to share with you all that will be shared out with all of our participants in the statutory committee meeting today. I will go through them briefly and I won't um, cover them in great detail in the interest of time today. Um, one of our first updates this morning is that we wanted to share um, a welcome, of course, to all of our new members as well as some uh, special participants we have today. Um, we have Deputy Director Sheila Showlander from the department with us. Um, to her right, we also have um, the new director, Jesse Torres of the Governor's Office of Highway Safety. I've been told we may have some ADOT representatives on the line joining us as well today. And um, we really are, are um, appreciative of everyone's participation in today's meeting. From the Bureau of EMS and Trauma, we also have a couple of new um, staff members that have joined us since our last staff meeting. I'd love to introduce Erin Henderson that joins us um, working within the CON and RAPES program. And we also have Marielle, tell me if I get this right, Mucci? 
Munchie. Munchie, um, who is our newest epidemiologist joining the Bureau of EMF and Trauma. So welcome. Thank you again for Shelly, we have our slides and um, yeah. I have an updated organizational chart to share with you all that will be part of today's information that we will push out. I, I had a little glitch, I'm sorry. I am a puzzle. We are back on. Um, and so just for everyone's awareness, um, since our last staff meeting, this is the updated department organizational chart for the Arizona Department of Health Services. Um, we have Jenny Kunico, the director. Um, and for awareness, because we get this question quite often from stakeholders, um, under the um, department's umbrella is the Division of Public Health Services. And um, you can see in blue, um, the blue star of life is where the Bureau of GMS and Trauma resides within the Department of Health Services structure. We can go ahead and keep rolling through some additional updates, and again, I will be brief. Today is a very exciting day, and we appreciate all the participation because we are celebrating the successes and accomplishments of Arizona's EMS and trauma system. We have the 2023 annual trauma report that we will run through today. Um, it is a day that we want to send a special thank you to all of our trauma centers, EMS providers, and of course, the public body members that make this report possible. Um, this really is honoring the contribution to the trauma system and improving patient care as we go through the report today. Um, today is very special because we'll be presenting a new dashboard and summary report for you all based on the feedback that you've gotten from um, the public bodies and advisory board. We'll cover this in more detail as we go through the agenda today. Um, so we can just keep looking. We have the snapshot of the EMS and trauma system. And the next slide. Uh, for awareness, we will be talking a bit about, as we move through today's agenda, we'll be talking a little bit about the strategic planning needs assessment that's being conducted in partnership with the four regional councils. Um, and we are very excited to cover that in more detail a little bit later. We also have legislative updates that we want to make sure everybody keeps apprised on. And so the next couple of slides are just for general awareness and will be in your packet. Um, if we go next, we have some rule updates. It has been a very busy rulemaking season for the department. Um, as you all know, every five years, we do a five-year review of our rules. And for EMS and trauma, that meant that in the last year, we were gonna be doing a, an update to many of our rule packages. Uh, in 2022, we had updated EMS scope for practice. In 2023, we had updated air ambulance and trauma center rules. And we are now working through our ground ambulance rules and preparing to also look at EMCP certification and training next. Um, for awareness, we have an ambulance rulemaking timeline, and the big announcement for this group is on our next slide. New trauma center rules were effective as of September 18th. Um, as many of you know, because we solicited feedback and comments from the, the State Trauma Advisory Board, these updates were based on some of the administrative issues that were identified over the last five years. Um, we're very appreciative of all the comments and feedback we got to be able to make sure that the rules are very clear, concise, and effective. And we have a link to the rulemaking and the most recently published rules, again, that were effective September 18th. Um, the next thing that we want to make sure we're covering today is that we have a survey link that remains open to get feedback from STAB and the trauma centers on the future of Arizona's trauma registry. Um, that is an agenda item we will cover later today, but please be advised that survey link is still open. September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Um, today, there was a blog published online talking about working to reduce the number of Arizona suicides, and of course, the goal here is zero. We have an updated website to share with you all, and we want to make sure that all of our committees have those updated resources, um, especially the 988 resources here in the state. Um, and Starting to wrap up the Bureau report, we are preparing for November Crash Responder Safety Week. Certainly, as we go through all of the updates from the annual trauma report, EMS and trauma play a role, a significant role, in the safe system approach. And it's so important that we acknowledge um, that we continue to see increases 
in the number of crashes across the state. Um, we have seen an increase in trauma incidents as well reported this year compared to past years. Um, and motor vehicle accidents remain one of the top causes of trauma and preventable injury and death in the state. Um, so we want to continue to look at the safe system approach. Again, we're appreciative that we have um, so many partners from the Governor's Office of Highway Safety and ADOT joining us to have some discussions as we review the last year of the Arizona Trauma System data. Um, and we'll continue these conversations as we prepare for November and crash responder safety week messaging. Um, finally, as we're wrapping up here, we have um, our updated EMS and trauma portal. And we just want to keep plugging that if there are any questions from stakeholders. I will turn it over next um, to Vassal, who's going to share a little bit on our updated EMS and trauma data dashboard if she's available. Vassal, if you're not, we certainly can come back to you as we review the trauma report a little bit later in the agenda. Are you with us, Vassal? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we can. can. Thank you, Vatsal. Yes. Okay. So you just want me to give me a little snapshot of uh, both the reports, right? Not talk about in detail currently, correct? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm right. Then I'm not sharing anything right now. Uh, we, I will just give a little overview of of the trauma report. Uh, or Shelly, do you want to put up the just the snapshot, and I can talk about the snapshot. Uh, what we have done this year, we decided is that uh, we will create, we won't be creating that 50 page of the PDF report of trauma annual report, which we used to create every year. But we we will do a concise report, uh, which talks about the summary of the trauma annual report in the PDF format. But instead, we will uh, create a very in-depth dashboard, which will give you not only which won't cover just that annual report, but many other things it will cover apart from the what we used to, what I used to be able to uh, display it in the PDF report. So this dashboard will help you filter it out at level of designations and different age groups. So uh, so you won't be you won't be just seeing the overall picture, but you will be seeing the overall picture if you just want to do level one or a level four trauma centers, or if you want to do just the pediatric or a geriatric age group and you get all the the, um, uh, and the entire trauma picture at that level so the dashboard is basically is going to give you a very in-depth overview and uh, the pdf report will cover the highlights of that annual report so that's a plan we are thinking to move forward with the way we are in the same thing applies to ems we decided the last year to do the same thing that ems also let's move more digitally than the uh, pdf report uh, what you all, the, uh, so what we are say, seeing um, over here is the EMS and trauma uh, dashboard. Some, some, just the synopsis of uh, the dashboard is uh, what what you guys are seeing. Number of trauma cases per like to this year we had sixty eight thousand trauma cases. Then the what is the mortality? What is the mortality among pediatric and geriatric age group? And then some of the protective and uh, factors and the risk factors in the in the tra in, in trauma. So they, the, those have been identified. So I can talk about the statistics more in depth. You know later in the part of the call then. Thank you, Vato. Mm -hmm. All right, next we will move to our standing committee report. Uh, Sean, do you have a CHEPI update? Good morning, I do. Um, our last CHEPI meeting was in July and uh, the minutes were approved as presented. Noreen mm -hmm. explains the survey and steps prior to the official RFP process. Julia uh, Vincent explains next steps of workforce needs, survey and strategic planning. Botsel displayed updated dashboard info. Thank you, Botsel, you do such a good job. Gail um, or Dr. Bradley gave share updates and the share user group will meet November 8th at 2 p.m. Bylaws were approved as amended and um, Chief Garcia showed slides for rulemaking progress and next steps and the meeting was adjourned and that's it for Peppy. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandy for education update. 
Uh, yes, we had we had a lot to discuss in education, uh, so I'll try to do my best to make it as brief as possible. Um, we had our bureau report from Chief Garcia. We talked about the Naloxo Leave Behind program and the ADH uh, opioid web so website. Sorry, the uh, Naloxo Leave Behind training program is on the is on the website also. Uh, Dr. Bradley shared that with us. Uh, Chief Garcia also shared a slide set. And um, and it was uh, shared with the members after the meeting uh, on uh, the uh, naloxone leave behind program. We also discussed the next steps for EMS uh, trauma needs assessment and work uh, workforce needs study. And um, Julie uh, Julie thanked everybody who submitted the responses, and uh, they will be compiling the data. We did discuss and amend, and we did approve. Uh, forming a work group to create fall uh, prevention mitigation training due to the fact we have a very high incidence of falls with hip fractures. Uh, we discussed, amended, and also approved um, updating or approved the draft uh, bylaws as they were amended. We discussed and approved forming a work group uh, for the draft training on pediatric seizure management. We also um, looked over our training modules and approved forming a work group to update or and or create materials as they're needed. Uh, we discussed and amended uh, to perform uh, a work group to create um, on pediatric airway training. That was also approved. And then we, uh, we did discuss the uh, ground ambulance rulemaking and the next steps, uh, Chief Garcia, did uh, display slides and had a lot of information on that process for us. Um, she also did share a summary of proposed changes based on patient care pr proposed response time standard benchmarks. That was a lot that we did. So thank you. That's my report. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Dr. Kavitch Moran is not available today, so I will give a brief update about PMD. Uh, PMD did approve uh, two new uh, medications to be considered for MDC this afternoon. Uh, these are methylcysteine uh, as well as octreotide, and those are both going to go to uh, MDC for review and approval of both the medications to be added to the drug tables for inner facility and hospital use, as well as the uh, associated drug profile. And that is the main summary from PMD. Thank you. Uh, Heather, do you have an update for trauma program managers workshop? Hi, yes, sorry. Thank you. So our last term of our managers meeting was in Flagstaff on August 18th. Um, it was a good meeting, lots of good turnout. Um, they went over some Tai Chi with ground level falls, um, the ATV injuries and some of the push towards the ATV injury prevention updates, um, the image trend application process. And uh, we had a lecture on care for emergency care for burn patients. Overall, um, great a meeting and we're preparing for the next one. Uh, thank you. And uh, next, Adam for a patient update. I'll give a patient update. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. The last team's meeting in July, we did not have quorum, so the meeting was purely informational. David Harden provided an overview of state transport for children strategies, um, and then Adam provided some updates on resources available through the EMS for Children program, including the Epic Car Seat Cars, uh, the Neonatal Resuscitation Program training, and also shared some um, results from the National Pediatric Readiness Assessments. Um, Adam also asked for volunteers to help with the ADA authority guidelines for schools document, which is in progress. Um, and then lastly, Shelly described a new process for case of education materials to put all work groups on the education agenda. Thank you. Uh, all right, next we will move to discussion and action item. If I can get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve the staff meeting minutes from May 18th. Could you please say your name when you make a motion? Sandy, I will make the motion. Thank you, Sandy. All I right. do a second. Thank you. Uh, as Shelly scrolls through these, these are in your packet as well. Are there any recommended amendments to the meeting minutes? All right, hearing none, anyone opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Meeting minutes are approved. 
Uh, next for action item, if I can get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve draft staff 2023 annual report uh, recommendations before publication on ADHS website on October 1st. Uh, please note this year, moving forward, the uh, Bureau is changing to a report presentation that will, instead of being a PDF document, will have an actual interactive data dashboard, which will be available for public use. Uh, we will continue to have the executive summary uh, that we will provide to this committee with the uh, dashboard annually, uh, but this will be hopefully the new format moving forward if this committee approves. So if I can get a motion and a second, please. Move to approve. Gamer. Thank you. Second, Brian. Thank you. All right, we've got a first and a second. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, kind of start with just the executive summary that you'll see that is attached in your meeting packet as well. Uh, first, we really wanted to acknowledge the uh, members of both staff and Tepe, uh, as well as the entire comic community. We recognize that all of the work and effort that goes into producing this report really comes from the efforts from the comic uh, population and response throughout the state of Arizona. So we really appreciate everyone's uh, participation uh, in these different work groups as we go through this. Uh, there are some uh, key things that we wanted to go through uh, that I will highlight first on this before we actually go to the interactive component of the dashboard. Uh, so these are some screenshots of the dashboard. We really wanted to give people an idea of the type of kind of granular information that is available. Um, and if you'd like, if you want to open the actual dashboard. Okay, so we're going to have to do that. Okay. I don't stop out. Sh Shelly, if you don't mind, can I share my screen on that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And while Vassal pulling it up, um, we just want to thank all the groups, um, staff, Tepe, um, all of the feedback that we've gotten in terms of moving to dynamic dashboard uh, visualization data. I, I think it's really a step in, in the right direction. We will now have the ability as we move forward and meet um, regularly throughout the year to review the dashboard and determine if there are additional data points that uh, the advisory board or other committees are interested in looking at. Um, it really is phenomenal to be able to visualize the data in a dynamic way moving forward. So thank you, Bustle. Um, so, do you need Carissa as backup? We've got Carissa. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not allowing me to share. All right, we're going to have Carissa open her. So, if Carissa can, oh, um, that's. All right, so the first page is the introduction page on the dashboard, which gives you an overview of Arizona State Trauma Registry, talks about the data collection part, what, what are we collecting. Apart from that, you know, we have added from 2017 onwards, we see the uh, number of trauma centers that have been added uh, in Arizona and by level of designations. So what the main thing to observe from over here is that if we see from 2000, 2020 last two three years uh, you know we are our last four years almost we are we have not changed in the number of uh, trauma centers level one trauma centers have stayed 14 and um, level four trauma centers are in the range of 27 with 20 in 2021 there was 28 but you know the, the number has stabi stabilized and what it tells me is that because of the number stabilizations in uh, the, when we see an increase in the number of patients, usually it is not because we have added more trauma centers, but we are seeing kind of an actual increase in particular injury. So that that was the reason for me to put this particular information over here to reflect to see that if I'm comparing to any of the years, Emma, is it because the number of trauma centers has changed or not? Can we go to uh, uh, the demographics page? I will go to the snapshot later on, Karisa. Uh, at the end because snapshot is kind of a summary okay perfect um um on this page i have there are three filters available at the top one is the year and uh, if you look at the year scroll down there were 
that we have data going back to 2017. Um, so any part previous years you wanna we want to see, you can just select the, whichever the year you want, and it will change the uh, pattern. So guys, if you don't mind, just select it 2017, just to show how it works. And then if you select the 2017, all the graphs then changes based on that. Let's go back to 2022 again. The next uh, uh, tab is on the trauma center designation level, and it will give you if you just want which level. So if you just want to see only for the level one, level four, or level three, that particular that also you know the data will filter based on that. And then the age groups we have kept the pediatric and uh, uh, greater than or equal to sixty five years of old. So again, those changes will get reflected in in on the all the four graphs below. So what we have seen is that from 2017 to 2020, the trauma incidents and the rates have been increasing in the you know, in Arizona. Like you know, in 20, 20 in tw from 2020 to 2021, there was a big jump, and then again it jumped in 2022. With the race and ethnicity, our American Indian and Alaska Native they have the highest trauma rate compared to any other ethnicities over from, and that has that's been true since 2017 we can see in all the years that particular ethnicity has affect is has affected more than compared to other by age and groups what we are seeing that in the younger age group between a male and female i mean male have higher trauma rate compared to females but as the after the 65 year old we can see the how the gap has increased there is a way more female trauma rate compared to the compared to males and county specific trauma rates uh, we ha have more trauma rates in a rural part of arizona compared to the urban part of arizona so if we see maricopa uh, pima pinal those are kind of a darker green in color which is on the uh, scale they are at the lower side and as the color changes from darker to the lighter green to the gray uh, uh, red color those are our rural part of arizona and we have a higher trauma rate in the rural part of arizona okay so can we please go to trauma mechanism under trauma mechanisms again all the three filters the similar three filters which were available on the first page they are available to filter it out um our main mechanism of trauma is fall with 34,000 cases of fall, which is like almost 50% of our trauma mechanisms were due to fall. And if you put a cursor uh, on a fall, we can see there is a trend uh, from 2017 to 2022. It shows the trend in fall trauma, uh, fall, like, you know, over the years, what, what was happening. And we you can literally see how falls are increasing in trauma in, uh, in Arizona. Regardless, I mean, we saw in the first page that, you know, number of trauma centers have not increased that much. So it is not actually due to more hospitals sending their data, but it is actually increasing the number of false cases in Arizona. The second highest mechanism of, uh, of injury is MVT occupants. And again, if the cursor is put over there, you can see all the uh, last you know, six years of data, like how many cases are there. Um, again, uh, um, just to point out, yes. Sir. So I was just going to say, I think uh, this is a really nice table to demonstrate how well and accurate this uh, reflects kind of the reality of our picture. We know that in 2020, obviously, during the first COVID surge, and uh, when things were closed down, there was less uh, vehicles on the highway left access and we saw a big drop in our volume there right yeah i was just going to mention that in 2020 you can see that dip there is around 9800 mvt occupant cases but it increased uh after the 21 and 2022 we were back to the you know increase in number of accidents um so yeah so that, that with this this gives basically all the trauma mechanisms and we have firearm cases and with non-traffic and you can see the trend once you scroll over there you can see the um, trend for by years for each of the trauma mechanisms and um what on the sides what you see is mortality number of deaths 2.6 percent mortality and which is 1771 cases of trauma deaths then number to total hospital charges for, um, 
and what how much was suspected or confirmed drug and alcohol and we saw that 23.8 which is like around 24 percent quarter of the populations uh, who were involved in trauma they basically either had a suspected or confirmed either drug or alcohol in the system uh, 55 percent required hospital admission and medium length of stay was three days um, and then again it oh, gives you race specific and age and gender specific trauma rate so Carissa, if you just select falls in the in that table or uh, there is another feature you can do the difference you select the fall everything will change for fall all those graphs will change so if you can see in the fall we have 666 deaths 1.9 percent that is total 1.9 percent fatality uh 15 percent suspected confirmed alcohol 61 percent got admitted and then which race and ethnicity was affected more we can see the white population white and his, uh, non hispanic has more fall rate compared to any other ethnicity and then obviously asian gender wise we said that female and elderly females will have a higher falls rate similarly if we choose mvt occupant so if you can choose mvt occupant and then it will change the demographics for you to see okay what is the impact of mvt occupant um now again just showing you the advantage of the dashboard that in the physical actual physical report i was not able to give you the demographics for each and every mechanisms of injury but over here, just, you know, this is another great advantage is that, okay, you click on the injury and now all the statistics can change. So I can just put the five graphs on one page, but that five, five graphs can give you so much more than what a physical report. I mean, there is no way I could have done all these injuries and the, the, and the demographics in the physical report. So if you go on the firearms and then if, if you select firearms and it will give you the statistics for firearms and it will change it for firearms and it tells you, okay, what is the fatality? And and as you know, the fatality is highest among, of course, we know uh, it's 14%, 332 deaths happen. The demographics changes, the age group now becomes more in the, you know, the Teflon, it starts, 15 to 17 to like 45 to 54 it's kind of that is a demographic involved more among black and african-american followed by american indian population so we can choose whatever mechanisms of injury we want and it will give you the demographics and, and other statistics for that um by uh, so age, well, oh, oh yes uh, i was going to say for all mechanisms uh do you mind demonstrating the zero to seven age group because i know that was a question yeah, last year. i was just yeah. going there I was just going there. So if, okay, so if you can select the age group, pediatric age group, 0 to 17. And again, the picture changes for 0 to 17 years. And what we see is that uh, fall and MVT occupant kind of, those are the, again, the two main mechanisms of injury. Uh, but then there's some, some child abuse, some, you know, struck by again, some of those things also becomes prominent. At, uh, and you can see the fatality and alcohol and thing, all other statistics also. And for that particular age group, then if I go to just fall, if select the fall, and it will give me just for the fall what is happening among pediatric age group. Carissa, can we default everything to the like age groups, all age groups, and things? But just fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just 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 all and then go get out of fall. Yes, and double click on the fall and it will go get out. You will be out out from yeah, perfect. Thank you. Now let's go to the next step. Assaults. Um, so this page basically gives you four main types of assaults. And if you click on the types of assaults, Carissa, so people can see the drop down. Uh, there are um uh, child and adult abuse, cut peers, firearm, and struck by against. These are our, our four main mechanisms of assaults. And you we can select any one of them to see the picture, like what's going on. Uh, let me describe the all assaults, and then we can see one of the assaults to see how the pattern changes. So for all the assaults, we can see from 2017 to 2022, they be, it's been increasing over the years. A number of assaults. So we had 4,627 cases in 2017. Now we have 5,300 cases of assaults in 2022. Um, and what a very interesting pattern what we observed 
evil in the types of assault. So that green color, the first number, first one is struck by against. And what we have seen that that struck by against uh, is still our main mechanism of injury for assaults. But what you see is that it used to make up around 50% of cases in 2017, but it has been dropping, struck by, by against has been dropping in the numbers. Uh, uh, but we, as we know that the number of assaults are increasing, so okay, if one of the mechanism is decreasing, then which mechanism is taking over? It's kind of moving upwards so that the numbers still increasing overall in assaults. And what we saw is that that red color, what you see is firearm. And you know, the, the, your, that number of struck by against cases started decreasing and the firearm numbers have been started going up. Um, so that is kind of moving up. That's a that's pat change in pattern we we saw over the years. And again, these are um, again one of the cool feature of the dashboard. If it was a physical report, you know, just presenting you 2022 data, you know, unless we go back to the those previous years, it is difficult to see the, this kind of a pattern or observe observe these kind of patterns. And which dashboards makes it so easy for you to visually see it, what is happening for the previous years too. With the age, uh, uh, it's in the middle. The uh, we see the mountain, and it says that it's mainly the middle. Those age groups, you know, not at the extremes. We, we, we those assaults are not that much, but it's in the middle. Mainly, uh, again, uh, American Indian and um, Black or African American in these two populations, we uh, we see higher level of assaults compared to other ethnicities, and then some of our rural counties have very high high level of assaults compared to other counties. Now, types of assaults, we can choose one of the assaults to see how the pattern changes. Maybe we can see the struck by against, and that's our main mechanism of injury. But then once you see in and it changes the <clears throat> pattern, so you can see within struck by against, what are the demographics, what race and ethnicity, what county is mainly involved. And we can choose any of the assaults, adult child or adult abuse, firearm, and then to gather the demographics for those that particular assaults. Can we go to transportation to hospital, please? Now, this, this page gives you number of cases coming to the trauma center by air ambulance, ground ambulance, or privately owned vehicle. And we see that, you know, 5% is on air transport. Total cases are 5%. 72% came by ground ambulance and quite many, like 22% came by privately owned vehicle. Um, in, in rural and uh, 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 urban area, that graph shows air transports by injury locations, rural and urban. And uh, as we see the rural area, which is a darker color, purple color, which is, has higher air transport compared to urban area. And that is what we want to see. And that is what we are seeing in our trauma system that yeah rural counties are using more air transports uh, this graph what we you what you guys have by county basically it, in those that shows you if these are the pie graphs for each of the county and that uh, shows you like okay for each county what is the proportion of air versus ground versus privately owned vehicle and there's some interesting pattern we can see that you know uh, like uh, for Pima, Pima County, that uh, I mean the urban county, if we look at it, like Maricopa, Pima, we see a very that red color is very tiny, showing us that there is a lot, you know, very less air ambulance, air transport happening compared to other counties. I can see the red, you know, the proportion is high. Um, then our POV is is that light green color is the POV, and if you see, like look at the Graham County, Graham County people. The, P, the PO is way too high, you know. Usually it's a ground transportation, but you can see that some of the counties people come uh, by privately owned vehicle. Larger proportion comes by privately owned vehicle than the than EMS. So that this basically gives you each county, you know, reflection of proportions of air and ground transport and POV. The last page is a trauma center map. And that's all just the the, by county that and by level of designations for each of the county, you can see how many trauma centers are uh, present. And the below there is a just just for the urban region, just for the Maricopa County, it is uh, highlighted. 
to sh uh, show the locations because we have so many trauma centers in the center. Now, can we go back to snapshot? Now, the snapshot reflects a lot of summary from what we what I talked about, but it also gives you a little bit of some other statistics also other than what we saw in, inside the tab. So what we have seen over here that, OK, we had total 68,000 cases before, um, in 2022. Um, that means 187 average number of trauma incidents reported per day. Uh, and then there is a box for mortality, which tells you how many total deaths, how many pediatric deaths, and how many geriatric deaths happen. So 78 pediatric deaths and 789 deaths among age greater than 65 years. Uh, then on the same below, we, we, what we see is the top six mechanisms of injury and uh, top six trauma fatality mechanisms of injury. And what you have over there is the age group to select. So if I just want to see the pediatric or geriatric, it will give you what are the top six for each of those age groups and for the trauma fatality, what are the age, uh, what are the fatality uh, mechanisms of injury. So what we are seeing currently is that fall is our number one mechanism of injury. Um, and, and the fatality, the volume wise, fall is high, 662 deaths. But if I have to see the proportion wise, the color you can see like firearm and MBT pedestrians, uh, you know, they have a very high fatality, like 14% and 11%. So that uh, gets reflected over here. And then Carissa, if you just want to select pediatric, then we can just see among pediatric what is happening. So we saw in the pediatric 78 deaths, total deaths were there. And then look at the 26 deaths were due to firearm injuries among pediatric population. Even the fall was a number one mechanism of injury in among pedi pediatric patients too. Um, let's go back to all age groups. Uh, on your on the right, right side, we talk about the protective factors and the risk factors. So protective factors, we, uh, here we say that, OK, among the MVT occupants, 30% were not using um, passenger restraint. And in the motor, ve motor vehicle or motorcyclist or a pedal cyclist, that's a helmet use over there. And around 40% of motorcyclists were not wearing helmet. Whereas pedal cyclists, 63%. And 66% off-road vehicle, they were not using the helmet. And then, the, then it talks about, OK, if you are not wearing the seat belt, then 4% occupant died and pe 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 people who were wearing a seat belt in that cohort 1.2 percent of occupants died so that's just kind of like you know shows the effect of fatality uh, of seat belt okay on fatality similarly on helmet and now helmet we, we can see in the helmet group 3.8 percent of motorcyclists died whereas no helmet 6.7 percent um so it talks about the protective factors and then the risk factors are uh, alcohol and drugs. So what we saw are that 23.8% or nearly quarterly quarter number of patients were either suspected or confirmed drug and alcohol. And then I've shown the age groups to find it out, you know, where, where the risk factors lies in, like which age group. And we see again, it's that, you know, starts with 15 to 17. I mean, look at the 15 to 17 years old, like 18% of 15 to 17 years old had either drug or alcohol, you know, in those are the teenagers who are either driving or as a passengers, but, um, you know, and then 18 to 24, it's really increased 35 and it peaks in 25 to 34, um, 34 years old then. Then, uh, then starts coming down after that. So that basically a synopsis, synopsis of the entire trauma report is in the snapshot. And in the snapshot also, there is a year given at the top. So you can look at any year you want and you can get the entire summary of you know, okay, what, what happened in 2017 or 18, or whatever year you guys want to see that you can select that. So that was the brief description of the trauma annual report. If you guys have any questions, I'll take that. Thank you, Vatsal. I, I will read a few of the uh, few words for those who don't see the chat from Dr. Natrika. Uh, this mm -hmm. is awesome, a real step forward. So Dr. Patel, the new report structure, such functionality is great. Kudos. And Dr. Gamer, yes, this is indeed great work. Kudos to the Bureau of EMS Thomas, the team, and the designers of this dashboard. Thank so, you. <laughs> yeah, big, big thank you to Vatsal and her team. Uh, this is a pretty substantial shift, uh, but we really think this is a great step moving forward. 
Uh, this is one of the statutorily required reports that the Bureau does need to provide. Uh, and we really do want to get feedback from this committee. If there's items that you see not on this report, you would like to include it, things to add to the dashboard. Uh, Voxel is amazing in her ability to add things when we asked her to. So if there are items that we haven't addressed on the dashboard, things you would like us to see include, please let us know. Uh, historically, we did things at a more uh, regional level. Uh, this dashboard allows us to break it up into county-specific data. Uh, so it gives us more uh, specific data than the, than the regions, uh, but wanted to see what the group felt specifically about that question. Um, this is this is Dr. Gamer. Um, I there was a comment made about uh, falls uh, leading to hip fractures uh, in a lot of uh, scenarios. Uh, do we have actual figures on how many ground level falls lead to hip fractures uh, uh, in this report somewhere? So, Dr. Gamma, um, um, very good question. I mean, that is basically uh, our top two mechanisms of injury. One is motor vehicle traffic accidents and another is falls. We have developed a separate dashboard uh, for those two mechanisms of injury and uh, the, which does cover your question. And I think uh, I am in the process of one is already done, uh, updated with the new data. I have to update the uh, another dashboard. I think maybe next meeting I can present both the dashboards, which goes very in depth into each of these mechanisms of injury. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, is uh, how hard is it to download uh, the data? So say say I wanted to. To uh, you know, like like with uh, whiskers, you can download the data to an Excel. Is that an option, or or how hard is that? I know that is something we have to discuss as internally as a bureau, or you know, I don't know here. You know, if we if that is something we would like to achieve in the future, then we can work on it. So right now, the download capacity it has not been given. Okay, thanks. Would 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 definitely like to request that um, because I, I think that this data is so incredibly valuable for us. And then you know, um, and you can even make a requirement that you acknowledge the 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 bureau um, if you use the data, which I think we'd be um, happy to do. But I, I think it would be great for those of us who who write and do and do research. So, Dr. Natrika, there is one thing I would like to say though that we do have created a set of. Um, uh, data, data, data sets, the, the tables, which are kind of now uh, we de almost de-identified and you know co covered a small number of tables, which is available. Uh, uh, whenever there is a request comes, it, they are easily available for us to give us. Um, a lot of times we would be combining this data with with something else, for example. So we would download it and then we would uh, combine it with. You know whatever whatever it is that we're you know um, uh, uh, organ of interest or study of interest, and so um, and so that that's a that's a great thing to have available. But um, but uh, you know if, if we end up using this like we like we use uh, whiskers data, um, a lot of times it's just combined. So okay, yeah, I think definitely we can discuss about that. You know about giving that capacity. Yeah. Great work. This is amazing. And uh, just to alert. In regards to the hip fracture and ground level fall, just a reminder, Boxel had shared with this committee, I think one or two meetings ago, the dashboard she had put together, recognizing that a large volume of our ground level fall and hip fracture patients go to non-trauma facilities. And so those would not be captured in our stab report. And so when she actually pulled the data from the hospital discharge database and connected that with our AD peers data, we had a much higher volume of ground level falls with hip fractures. So that is one of the things to keep in mind that this data is very specific to patients transported to a trauma center. When we look at the overall morbidity and mortality related to falls, uh, to ground level falls and hip injuries, uh, that would really be under that separate dashboard uh, and not necessarily captured in this one. Uh, if we can go, if we can stop sharing this and go to the PDF of the uh, document, we do have some recommendations that we wanted to have staff review. It's on the last page of this one near the bottom. And yes, Chris, uh, Christopher Thompson, that, that to your point, that's why we have a separate 
uh, dashboard that uh, is based on hospital discharge database because we recognize that uh, the trauma report would not capture that population. Okay, Sean. Uh, Sean's question, sorry, is there a way to break down falls to ground level versus fall from height? Uh, can you address that question? Um, yeah, I think uh, with the I, we do collect ICD-10 codes information as, as far as we can, you know, um, differentiate between the two. We should be able to put that information also in, in the report. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, Kim, is I'm just curious here. Uh, number one, I did see somebody pop up in the chat or uh, somebody asked a question about access to the database, how to access it. Um, and then the other thing is, how granular can we get on some of these other things uh, through this dashboard? For instance, um, uh, for firearms and pediatrics, how many of those were suicide versus like accidental discharge versus violent crime? And how many of those things have like uh, alcohol or drug uh, as a factor inside those things? So are we able to get that granular with this yet? Uh, we we no, uh, the re I think uh, when we talk about at such a specific level, we also have to, uh, there are a couple of things happens, you know, when we look at it in a, such a detail that, okay, number of cases decreases. So then there is a potential that I, uh, you know, we, there is, that there are only few cases, you know, in few categories, and then that is not, uh, should be available on a public dashboard. So we uh, kind, uh, kind of not, the dashboards are not, to go to at such a granular level, but it to create gives you enough information basically to create a study around it and then uh, base, uh, work or uh, either get the data, work with the bureau or try to you know get the data in a way and then you know go in do the in depth study on those particular topics. Um, that is the I, I think the main purpose of the dashboard is that it gives you enough gra granularity to create your hypothesis and gives you enough basic statistics also for the studies apart from what PDF report used to give. But some of the, some in-depth questions we won't be able to answer just because then we go in a very small sample size issue. The other challenge is uh, in terms of that level of detail is what's documented by the EMS uh, crew. So oftentimes we're limited in terms of what type of information is gathered. Uh, so often it's left as very vague as simply a gunshot wound versus uh, sometimes people look at that in a report in the narrative. Uh, we can't capture data from the narrative. So when we try to get to very specific data elements, uh, that is one of the challenges. And we, like, as Bob mentioned, we really do try to make sure that the data uh, does protect, is protected uh, in terms of patient privacy. So that's why some of the numbers uh, get down to be pretty small. And so that's when we will kind of filter that out to make sure we don't get to the next. It would be great. Like, that's actually incredible. <laughs> like, just having this one. To this level, I think is uh, awesome. The goal is to have this published by October first. We do want to see if there's any specific recommendations from this group to adjustment uh, to the dashboard uh, before publication. Uh, that's kind of one of our big asks for the committee this morning. This report also captures recommendations from staff moving forward into the next year. Um, we have, a, I think it's about six bullet points teed up based on many of the meetings and work that the board has um, initiated over the last year. Um, going to, uh, in line with some of the questions that uh, Dr. Southworth posed and some of what we've heard through the chat, uh, there are opportunities, of course, to collaborate across other um, departments and groups that work on the same subject. Um, there is more granular data available, especially through the child fatality report that is published annually. That annual report comes out in November each year. Um, so we're looking back a, a year or two at this point, but certainly hearing some of the questions and comments on the dashboard, um, one of the recommendations is to collaborate with groups like the child fatality review team and to review that information to develop policy recommendations moving forward to prevent injuries and deaths. Um, we can leave this up on the screen for a little bit longer to see if there are folks that um, in looking at the recommendations have anything to add or edit. Sean added in the chat, she questions the appearance of mortality 
ground level fall hip fracture between trauma and non trauma center. I, I'll leave that to Voxel. I don't know since those are two different data sets. Voxel, I think the question is could you include on this dashboard a comparison of mortality between, with hip fractures in uh, trauma versus non trauma centers? I know those are two different. Uh, data sources. I'm not sure that could be included in this uh, dashboard or if that would need to be a separate one. Um, we are asking just for falls, right? Yes, ground level uh, falls with hip injuries. I kind of looking at mortality. Yeah, I, I think we can set, I can now uh, update the fall dashboard, not in this dashboard because this is not about falls. And if just for the fall, if I'm pulling another that, the, the database and has no effect on any other mechanisms of injury, does not make sense. So it will, it the appropriate place for that would be on in the fall dashboard and we can see if we can pull from both the level and i can update the fall dashboard that way thank you does that answer your question sean yes it did thank you very much lots of amazing work thank you <clears throat> Any further discussion? Otherwise, I will uh, go ahead and take a uh, vote on approving. Uh, should I make a comment about the process? Um, in terms of the process, we just wanted to let you all know once we do receive the staff recommendation to move forward, um, the department will do another review in terms of the dashboard to get it ready um, and approved for publication on our website. Similarly, we'll do that with um, the State Trauma Advisory Board's report summary to put forward. Um, some of the recommendations we've gotten are to beef up the background and methodology as we prepare to standardize this format moving forward. So we will do another review after we get the recommendations here from staff today. Uh, and I just have to make a comment before you guys vote. Uh, we often talk about mortality rates when we look at this data each year, right? In the last year, 1,771 deaths were recorded as patients who were treated at a trauma center and, and died at a trauma center. That's 2.6%. If you look at the inverse of that, we have over a 98 or 97% survival rate because of the EMS and trauma system we've built here in the state of Arizona. That is a huge success. We need to make sure we're acknowledging those successes and um, how far we've really come as a state. So phenomenal work. We appreciate all your feedback and input to be able to put these recommendations forward each year and look forward to continuing to work with you guys. Thank you. So I will go ahead and move to a vote then. Is anyone opposed to the uh, draft that annual report and dashboard as uh, projected today? Please say nay. Hearing none, any abstention? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, I will uh, just touch base. Dr. Patel said he had to drop off. He said there is no uh, updates right now from ACF. They have their next committee of trauma meeting uh, next month, so he anticipates having an update uh, for our follow-up uh, follow staff meeting. So he said no update today from the American College of Surgeons Committee of Trauma, but he will have an update after their meeting next month. Uh, next, I'm going to go ahead and hand over to Carissa for a discussion on the ARC process for the uh, ASTR. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so as most of you know, um, we'll be leaving trauma one in the coming years because it'll be sunsetted out. Um, and so what we've done is we've passed out or we've distributed the survey um, that we discussed earlier. Um, and we have that out for the last month or so, and that will be open through, we'll say the end of the week. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken the, the summary of all of the responses we've gotten, um, and we've put that into our scope of work. Um, we had a meeting on Tuesday on the 19th, and some of those top things that you guys have said are important to you are training and education, um, customization for the registry, um, and just ease of use. You want to make sure you don't lose any of your data, um, and you want to know what kind of implementation timeline there's going to be. Um, so what we're going to be doing, we're going to just going through the RFP process for our new registry system. Um, so how that's going to happen in the next few weeks, we're going to be submitting that to our state procurement department. Um, so they'll take our scope of work and then any registry system company who wants to bid on it um, can place a bid and then those bids will then be evaluated to see 
which registries that the best meets the needs of the state. Um, and we've taken, like I said, all of the, the input you guys have given us and put it into the scope of work. Um, so any anyone who bids on that has to meet those requirements. So um, if you guys want to give any more feedback, we love all of the feedback. We want to make sure that the registry is what you guys need um, at a hospital level as well as, as, well as at the state level. Um, so we're hoping to have that procurement uh, RFP process started by you know, October and then have it finished by July of 2024. Um, and then once we have the new registry product chosen, have that implemented in at everyone's hospital by July 2025. Um, and as was mentioned at the, at the meeting on Tuesday, um, if we pick a product and a hospital chooses to go with a different product, you guys are more than welcome to um, pick a different registry system, um, just as long as we can still get your data. Um, that's, that's the important thing. So um, if you guys have any more feedback, still please feel free to reach out, fill out the survey, and um, we'll get to process. Thank you, Carissa. And Julia did put a link to the survey in the chat. So for some reason you have not uh, got communication about that, there is a link in the chat for the survey as well uh, for your uh, ability to fill out. Uh, just as we um, as we send out this slide deck, Carissa did prepare um, several slides that were presented on September 19th this week, and we can certainly share those out if that's helpful for folks to see what has been um, submitted so far. That'd be a great idea. Thank you. Uh, next up, to give a little background of the next uh, topic, uh, the EMS Council, we decided to start a, a EMCT of the Year Award for the four regions, and we coincided uh, with EMS Week that was in May of this year. And it was really well received by uh, the four individuals who received the award. It's, I think it was very meaningful for kind of all of us here at Bureau. We recognize that we're uh, a lot of what we do is regulatory, but a lot of what we uh, also have is more kind of data collection, public health pre preparedness and prevention. And we wanted to take some time to recognize all the EMS providers that uh, are responding throughout the state. And we really would like to bring towards Deb, and I'll turn it over to Maria. I just want to get that background, the opportunity to do something similar for our trauma community. I think it's always important to give the positive uh, feedback to individuals uh, and not always just have that regulatory hat. So that's just a little bit of background as to what we're looking at. So I'll hand it over to uh, Noreen and Davis. So moving forward, what we'd like to do is um, get recommendations for, I believe it's trauma medical director, trauma managers, registrars, injury prevention providers. Um, with the EMF, we were able to do from each region an EMS provider. Um, that's not going to work for trauma only because the region, the trauma centers are not evenly dispersed throughout the region. So we're looking for feedback for this group as to how would we come about, how would we accomplish recognizing um, individuals? Uh, and if anyone is interested in helping us um, formulate that, and participate, we're, we're we'd love to have your, your feedback. And um, I think that that's pretty much it. You know, some of the conversation that we had internally at the Bureau is, do we try to separate out, uh, you know, level one versus level three and four for the different awards, looking at trauma program managers, trauma medical directors. Uh, then we also re recognize that uh, at some facilities, especially a level three or four, the trauma outreach individual may be the same as trauma program manager. And so there may not be some of those uh, different levels. But we really would like feedback, uh, especially from our trauma facilities that are participating today, uh, what categories you think we should look at awarding. We have some time. Uh, I think we would like to do this as well, because I think trauma recognition with month is out of May, correct? So we, we do have some time before uh, the next round, uh, but this, this group won't reconvene until January. So I wanted to get feedback from everyone here uh, if there's some thoughts on how to delineate some of those awards and recognition. You know, should it be rural versus urban? I think there's a big difference. So um, I think there's a lot we can do with it. It's a little bit more complicated than the um, EMS provider of the year since, you know, it was based on regions. So if anyone is interested in helping us um, craft this, um, you can reach out to me, uh, Julia, Davis, uh, Shelley, and, you know, I'll post you in future discussion moving forward. Any thoughts from anyone who's on the meeting right now? Uh, this gamer, I'd be happy to uh, participate with uh, trying to figure out what's best uh, uh, regarding level one versus levels three and four, urban versus rural 
those sorts of things. Have some ideas. Um, maybe others that represent regional councils might want to uh, get into this as well. Thank you, Dr. Gamer. I'd be happy to help. Uh, next on the agenda is discuss next step on the Arizona EMS trauma needs assessment and strategic plan. Julie, I'll hand over to you for this. First, um, so Rachel already mentioned a bit about this earlier, but we are currently in the middle of working on our needs assessment and strategic plan. Uh, so thus far, we've completed the survey portion. So we sent out surveys against individual EMTs and then organizations. And our next step is to conduct focus groups. So. I've been reaching out to different regional councils and associations to try to get some focus group meetings on the calendar. Uh, we can definitely share upcoming opportunities to participate in that process um, with the group. Um, we did have our first focus group session with the Central Region yesterday. Um, basically, what that looks like is we presented on the survey results and then used the polling software to get some additional feedback on what priorities might be included in the 2025 to 2030 um, Bureau of strategic plan. Um, so thank you so much to AIM for letting us come to the meeting um, in that process and um, stay tuned for upcoming opportunities to participate. Thank you, Julia. All right, launch for discussion and action items. If I can get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve updates to the bylaw. Move to approve, Gamer. Thank you. Second, Sandy. Thank you both. All right, just a little background. We uh, do are required to review and update our bylaws, I think, every three years, correct, Shelly? So we were due for an update. Uh, the draft that Shelly is sharing has some edits in red. Uh, we are trying to make these consistent across our statutory and standing committees. Uh, one of the updates that was recommended, there was kind of twofold under the terms of membership. Um, one thing that was at, was a request was to add or until a position is filled or replaced, whichever is later. This is in regard to when someone's term expires. We recognize when someone's term expires uh, and they may not get an update uh, for some time that affects either other committees more than staff, that some of our committees, there is a little bit of a lag time between that. The other is a requirement that all public body members uh, participate in the uh, orientation, which is an online course as well as the loyalty oath. This is just a requirement. Uh, we are ha we're having some issues with a few members not participating in those requirements. And so we just would like to include that in the bylaws. I uh, just clarifying the voting, voting by email shall not be authorized. Again, this is a public meeting. So that was one of the recommendations to include that. Uh, under regular meetings at the bottom, there's just a small typo. And then on page three, uh, we just are adding that members must be able to communicate their attendance via voice, chat, or in person. Uh, we have had some issues with potential questionable attendance, and so we wanted to make sure that that was very clear. We recognize sometimes uh, people may have audio issues joining by phone. Hopefully, they can unmute uh, or they can uh, go ahead and uh, type in the chat if they do not have a microphone. So those are the recommended edits and updates to the bylaw. Any questions or discussions about those? All right, hearing none, anyone opposed to the uh, recommended updates to the bylaws, please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next agenda items to be considered for the next meeting. Uh, if you have any items that you think of between now and January, uh, you can submit those to either myself or Shelly Bissell, and we will be sure to add those to the agenda. Uh, next, call to the public. Uh, we have a list of upcoming events on the agenda. These are also available on the Bureau's website, which includes news and conferences page and training program page. Our next meeting will be January 18th, 2024 at 9 a.m. Uh, we will continue with the hybrid format. If I can get a motion to adjourn, please. Motion. motion. No tricky. All right, thank you. Got a okay. first and a second. All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.